All right, great. Um, so uh, we're recording. Um, Joe, do you want to give us a quick introduction just in terms of the date and time of the meeting and just kick us off? Is that okay with you? I didn't... Sure. Um, so it's Joe McCoy, I'm the acting chair of the uh, sc School Reuse Building Committee, and it's um, November 17th at 5.05 p.m. And um, just because I will uh, defer to uh, Emily, who is uh, has the agenda and is has information for us. I'll defer to let her run the rest of the meeting. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, so yeah, so Emily, um, we'll kick it off. Um, the agenda is pretty pretty straightforward. Um, we're going to continue the dialogue from the last meeting about criteria. Um, there were two sets of minutes um, that were sent along. So maybe at the after we get through the bulk of what we need to, we can we can do the minutes. So. And then at the end, there will be a couple minutes for public speak time um, if anyone here uh, wants to ask any questions about items um, the last, you know, I'll try to stop at 5.55 and give a few minutes for that. So I think with that, I'm Jeff Bagg, I'm the city planner and with the committee here. And so I guess, Emily, maybe you want to take it away. I will share my screen. Um, good to see you all again. And um, let me pull up the right screen. Okay, great. Hopefully you can see this now. Oh, it's just loading. So, um, as Jeff said, uh, we have a good, um, uh, sort of a short agenda, but with a lot of time to talk in it. So we're going to give you an update on where we are in the process and the timeline. And then we've done some work at our last meeting about um, uh, these criteria for, that would be included in the RFP, whether it's requirements or whether it's evaluation criteria. So just to help us along in our conversation, um, I'm going to show you an extract of what, uh, what the two different criteria look like within two different RFPs just so you can see that and then we'll go back to doing the work that we were doing. I've moved things over on the mural boards so you can see how they start to fall out and that might change some of the ways that we think about what we're talking about. So with that just to bring you to update you on the the timeline this is the same one you saw uh, last time we're still in uh, this um, thinking about the reuse restrictions and I anticipate that after today's meeting I'm going to take what I heard from you and start to put it in the format that I'm about to show you. And then in December, we're going to look at that format, see are there are there additional changes uh, that we want to make or things now that we see it in the correct format, um, uh, are there other things that we want to add? But before we get to that part of the meeting, Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you to sort of update what's been going on on the city side uh, in terms of the, the overall project while we've been working on these components. Right. Thank you. Um, we've talked a couple times about um, a grant that was applied for to help us fund um, various uh, evaluations of the building. So it's called, you know, it's lumped into calling it due diligence, things that we can examine about the school buildings ahead of releasing the RFP. To, to make more information known. Uh, but there's a lot of things involved in that, but um, it's it's a bad news, good news scenario, which is that we um, did learn that we did not get the One Stop for Growth uh, grant that we had applied for, um, which, which was for $100,000 to do, you know, five or six um, baseline evaluations of each of the buildings and do some of the site evaluations um, so that's the bad news, um, but the good news is that the one of the 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 funding agency, uh, which is one of the funding agencies, is Mass Development, and Mass Development came back to us and um, wants to continue to wants to work with us um, outside of the One Stop program. So we are um, in in discussions with them about coming up with a scope of service for them to. And Mass Development is a quasi, so it's part private, part public um, agency. And, and this is um, a big bulk of what they do is they help um, municipalities and they help developers, they help people get projects ready um, and information available for, for projects just like this. And so um, their partnership is a, a good um, thing. Um, we're going to be, we've met with them once. They did look at the schools recently. We gave them a quick tour and we're going to be creating a scope of services for them to bring in you know they have 
what they call house doctors. So they have consultants on, um, you know, basically in contract that they can pull in and do almost the same, the same exact things that we were going to do through the grant. We are going to try to do it with mass development. So um, the big windup is it's a little bit unclear if that will negatively impact our timeline. I think it will run pretty close to where we were anyway. Uh, but it's just kind of a new, it's a new twist on how we'll get some of that information done. And so this is like survey work for the properties. Um, this is doing some environmental testing of the inside of the buildings. Um, this is doing maybe some structural analysis to understand like, you know, our, our, our kids are in there, but structurally, can it be renovated, you know, for other purposes and understanding things like that. So that was those things were always part of what we needed to do. And it's really just that we have a different, maybe we have a different partner um, gonna help the city do that. So um, I think by the December meeting, we should have an update. Um, you know, if we're in contract with mass development to help us, we should then have a timeline for that. So uh, on the outside, nothing will really change because we're still gonna pursue those pieces of information. It's just the, you know, our partnership is a little bit different than we might have envisioned before. So I think with that, um, I think December will have a better gauge on the timeline. And in terms of the work that we're doing, um, it won't slow this sort of component of discussing the reuse restrictions down, and it probably won't slow down the initial draft of the RFP. They'll just be some um, pieces missing in terms of information that we might have that would be attached to the RFP, but it doesn't slow down that PR, just sort of the longer term uh, process. So, Great. Thank you. Well, Chris, did you raise your hand? I, I, I did, but you covered my question. Okay. All right. Perfect. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Okay. So then just this is just an image, a very fuzzy image, because this is a, a small JPEG uh, blown up. But just uh, to remind you that we worked on the initial criteria that were in the downtown strategic plan to start with and started putting them on this line from what was less important to what was more important, trying to get uh, transition from the original planning study to what components would be in the RFP. And we looked at community benefits, financial consideration, architectural design, circulation, access, and parking, compatibility, and that's compatibility with existing construction and with the neighborhoods, sustainable development, and building uses. And where we're leading to is a combination of two things. Uh, one is uh, in uh, some places it's called objectives and guidelines, or I've seen goals and objectives or objectives and goals. We'll look at two of those. And those are the things uh, in the RFP that says, this is what we're really trying to do. This is what we want you, the developer, to respond to. Um, and uh, generally, those are the kind of the base requirements. And then the other thing that we're looking at is the evaluation criteria how do we judge whether one developer's proposal is better than the other so I've picked Adams and Amherst uh, as our examples for RFPs today uh, Amherst RFP I believe is actually due uh, the responses are due either later this week or next week um, and they have very different approaches to these objectives and guidelines and then to the evaluation criteria. So that'd be a nice way of, of showing you what some of the options are to think about. So Amherst breaks down their objectives and guidelines into these categories, the types of housing. Um, in this case, they're looking for all affordable housing, the different levels of affordability that they're looking for. So percentage of area median income, design and construction guidelines, bedroom configuration, so they talk about minimums for the number of uh, bedrooms in the units and that they're looking for affirmative fair housing. And there are other requirements, but these are the, the closest in terms of the objectives and guidelines. Now, within their design and construction guidelines, Amherst gets quite specific. And I will, of course, give this to Jeff to uh, circulate to um, all of you after this call. Um, uh, so they have uh, two sets. They, they've actually put them all in one long list, but as I broke it down, there's a set that's required and a set that's preferred. And then within one of the required, the green and climate resilient design, they have a menu of options. So required is this idea of architectural quality and compatibility, the green and climate resilient design. Um, they're 
their particular sites are two sites that are addressed by this proposal or this RFP, and at least one, maybe both, have wetlands. So they want a site design and uh, layout that's responsive to the wetlands. They want a minimum of one parking space per unit enhanced accessibility, at least one community room, on-site management office, and then on one of the properties there is a historic building um, that has a lot of community value and that building must be preserved and reused. Now it's interesting because when we get to the preferred, they had a minimum of one parking space per unit is required. They would prefer one dual head electric vehicle charging station per 20 units. So right away you know that it developer responding to this that has that electric vehicle charging station is going to be looked on more favorably than a developer that just does the parking spaces. They've also asked uh, for tenant storage space as a minimum, but including the bike storage and outdoor bike racks is preferable. And then instead of just one community room, having one per site is something that's preferable. Now, when you get to the green and climate resilient design, they broke it down into this menu of options, which I thought was an interesting component for us to think about is, um, again, uh, giving the developers some flexibility in their response by saying these things are important to us, but we anticipate that you're not going to be able to do them all and so what would we like you to do and you can see that they've got a couple of different things in here insulation heat pumps um, uh, double pane insulated glasses energy recovery systems so some of these are clearly uh, more difficult to provide uh, especially in perhaps reuse buildings some of these will be easier so they've got that menu of options now when we look at atoms this is their goals. These are their goals and objectives. So they had seven. And you can see how it's um, set up. So preference will be given to those that do these things. And they still have some of the um, same elements that Amherst does, but they don't get as specific as Amherst does. And so there is that ability to um, have the greater specificity and the lesser specificity. Um, so you can see here new quality market rate workforce housing. Um, um, positive impact on the local tax base, new jobs within the community. This has a uh, building with has a gymnasium in it, um, similar to East Hampton, and so this one preference to those who can retain it as a community-oriented use. Um, value to the community, community gathering places, pedestrian oriented. So these are um, uh, less specific than Amherst, and again, something to keep in mind. So this part goes into the main part of the RFP when we're listing all the requirements that the developer needs to uh, address as part of their proposal. The second piece that comes in is the evaluation criteria. And so this is often a table, um, although it doesn't have to be. And the rankings uh, on Amherst side, highly advantageous, advantageous, and unacceptable. Adams also had a not advantageous. And so when you get the proposal, Proposals, the idea is that these are ranked along this continuum. And so you can see that there's a, again a difference between Amherst and Adams is Adams broke it down into four criteria, four individual um, criterions that they then ranked uh, into these four buckets. Um, Amherst has much longer one, obviously. So they hit, uh, again, the things that were in their goals and objectives, the affordability, for example, the unit of bedroom, bedroom configuration. But they also uh, are ranking developers' track record, financial feasibility, the schedule, the design, the management and maintenance plan, which was another requirement. So a lot of these draw on the other requirements that were in the RFP. Um, so those components um, the feasibility, the schedule, aren't necessarily things that were, and the management and maintenance plan aren't necessarily things that we're talking about tonight, because those are fairly standard for being in an RFP. But things like the affordability, the um, uh, design, the sustainability, the community support, all of those components uh, would fit into what we're talking about tonight. And here's kind of an example about how those charts could look. So Amherst did do theirs as a table um, where they define 
design, it's not just we want the design to look good, right? As they define the components that they want out of it and then say what's how those are acceptable, unacceptable, advantageous, or highly advantageous. And then again, consistent with Adams being a little bit more um, uh more flexible or less specific, um, Adams has a, a much less sort of broken down components to their table. So again, there's this range of the things that we can do. So with that, I'm going to stop to take any questions, and then if there, are, you know, after I answer those questions, or if uh, um, if there aren't any, then I'll stop sharing this and bring over the Moreau board, and we'll go back to that. So anything anybody has any questions on? Uh, I do, Emily. Um, number one, are these single building RFPs or are these multiple building RFPs? So Adams was a single building RFP. Amherst is a two two separate sites. I believe each has a building on them. Okay, and these are RFPs that are, have not been released yet. Is that correct? Adams is older. It was released, um, and uh, I think it may be. It was February twenty twenty. So I, mean, I, I think what would be good just for us to have in our pocket, if you could find an actual RFPs that were successful. <laughs> So we know, okay, this, at least not that we have to go by it, but we know this was the criteria that someone bid at, you know, so. That is part of what I'm continuing to do. So okay. um, uh, I've had some schedule conflicts and trying to get some of the calls that I've been hoping to uh, have. But yes, I've actually gone through far more than these RFPs mm -hmm. um, and talked to a few people already about which ones have been successful and which haven't. I'm planning on reaching out to Amherst after they get theirs in mm -hmm. and just seeing if they'd be willing to talk about the process but i don't want to call them you know two days before the or two or three days before it's due right right so um and uh there's another school one that was just released that's also due with it or was released earlier this year that's also due within the next couple of days uh irving massachusetts released one for a school and okay. i'm planning on calling them as well as soon as the the deadline passes and just see what they've heard great thanks so any other questions on this section? All right, then I would, yeah, Jeff. I just have one. I mean, um, I think this will kind of come up more and more as we get through this, but um, Emily, I think you've talked about this. I think we talked about this as a group, but at, at some point in the RFP, there's like a, a little bit, there's an opportunity for East Hampton to promote itself, basically mm -hmm. to highlight where we are at as a community and, and the things that we feel are positive, obviously, is, uh, is what the things that we probably want to highlight. But we have some planning studies. We have this, I, I feel it at least, uh, this feeling of momentum um, with a lot of um, investment happening. And so we'll have that opportunity to kind of showcase where we think East Hampton's at. The interesting thing with some of this is, um, although we are feeling positive, we have had very little housing built and so um we want to continue through the process and be be mindful of if we require too much you know we want to make sure that we're balancing our requirements right with trying to get the schools redeveloped or occupied in some way so I, it's going to be this ebb and flow and you know we've had there are some other discussions happening in the town um just one as as a quick example is a little while ago there was a a proposal for um, to to require um, new construction to have solar, and it it hit a point where people learned of this and said, you know, this this could be a real big concern because some of the projects that we are hearing about are very tenuous, right? So they're just scraping by, and if we add on a, a real heavy burden requirement, then you know, that could make the project not financially feasible. So there are going to be these things that, and we've talked about this, I think, in the first meeting maybe, is that we want to be careful of the things that are absolutely required. And then we really have a chance with the preferences to really kind of gauge the things that we want to see. And so I just continue to be mindful of that. And we have, you know, two two potential scenarios. One is schools being renovated. Um, and we think that there's going to be some community value to that that the building structure stays. So we have to be mindful of what can actually be done with a renovation versus something, if, if it were to go to something that's new construction, then then 
we we might want to get more you know from that because that's a cleaner slate and that kind of thing so those will be discussions that we continue to have but i just was thinking about the difference between adams and amherst and you know the potential demand um and i i would love to put it like east Hampton like right in the middle of those two in terms of like the like what those communities might be going through and, and how they shape up you know we want to be mindful of our ability to pull in developers so that was that was it for for me on that one <laughs> Yeah, I think that that balance of specificity and flexibility is going to be our biggest challenge in, in uh, working with RFP. The, you know, the the showcasing of the community. There's a, a great spot at the beginning where people describe their their communities and what it's about. I think you know that's that's bringing that material together. The uh, sort of more boilerplate things of okay, you need to provide us with this information, this information, this information. We have this information. That's fairly standard. It's really in this review criteria and then the the objectives or the goals of the development that um, you know is the trickiest to get right in terms of making sure you have the right balance so I'm going to bring up our screen again and you should see that so this is where we left off in october um, we had been looking at these pieces up here that had uh, come out from the original plan um, and uh, you can see that there are the um, definitions are over here and then we were putting them some on the scale of the less important to more important what i did was i broke that down and so using the scale move the things over that seem to be highly advantageous. Um, actually, I'll zoom in. Ah, I like Google uh, um, uh, uh, Meet because I can see both screens now, so I can see how big it is for you. It makes it easier to zoom in. So I moved into, for example, these seem to be the highest on your scale, so I moved them over to highly advantageous, whereas those were a little bit lower on the scale, I put to less advantageous. These may well still be advantageous, but just to, to get an initial breakdown, and then just to, to you know make sure that we had a chance to talk about i think we got down to um uh we got down to the building uses and the sustainable development but we didn't really spend a lot of time on those last time so we might want to consider i think we we hit the we did hit the building uses but i think we skipped over sustainable development a little bit so i want to make sure and compatibility again we don't pull them down onto the line so i want to make sure maybe we start with those three and work our way backwards um but uh you know can also be guided guided by you all as well and in terms of the thoughts that you've had since our last meeting. I think at least for me, if you could zoom in a little bit more, that would Yeah, help. absolutely. Um, which, do you have a particular topic you'd like oh, me to Oh, no, I, th I thought we'd start with building uses, but okay. it's totally up to you. Yep, no, that's fine. Um, let's see. So building uses, what we had left, um, we hadn't really talked about diversity of housing types, although to um, uh, we'd had artists live work sort of in the middle and then market rate and affordable housing both were considered important. Um, then let me just check over here and then we had just a couple of so I'd use this side if you remember to um, capture some of the thoughts that we'd had. So um, uh, talking about whether or not we wanted 100% affordability, um, uh, the number of units that might be able to fit and still allow some commercial use and um, flexibility live studio live live studio and retail as was done in uh, Worcester and a couple of other components there so happy to continue on this discussion or move to the others I think the flexibility of future uses over time is important because if you know we want to have a built a buildings um, architecture to fit the future in an event that we don't need more affordable housing, which I don't really see happening, mm -hmm. but but it might happen 30 years from now um, where we want more retail because these are pretty downtown locations. And would you say that for you that fits right in here? Is it more or less important than artists live I, work? I think it's less for me. It's less important than artists live work, but I would mark move artists live, live work um, up past market rate housing if I had my way. <laughs> okay. Um, thoughts from others. 
I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, the 60 units, it, would, that, would, would that also be the case with a teardown of the buildings? Like, is that, is that basically the land footprint, what that will accommodate? I'll take a stab at that. It's a great question that I don't think we have done. I don't think we have enough information to determine that. I think if I remember correctly, we talked about the 60 units as um, was a, that was the preliminary look at what all three buildings could potentially accommodate if they were renovated. I think that was where that 60 comes from. Um, I think the our expectation generally should be that it would go up. The number of units should go up um, if if the buildings were not repurposed and if it was a demolition and reconstruction. I mean, I think that's the general. I'm pretty comfortable kind of saying that that would be the general understanding is that if it were new construction, the buildings could be configured a lot differently and, and likely increase the number of units. If that's if that helps answer that, Lauren, I don't know if that answers it. It's, it's we don't have enough information yet to 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 tell like definitively how many units we're talking about, but I think general rule of thumb would be uh, 60 is kind of like the idea of renovated buildings and then it would go higher. Just looking at the configuration of the buildings, the current buildings on the current sites, I would anticipate that if those were removed and the sites were reconfigured, that it would be above 60. But I agree with Jeff, we don't have that information at this point. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess one thing, just the, the two things I don't see on this scale are, um, so we go right from on the right side, the most important side, so affordable housing and then market rate. And we don't really have anything that is mixed, like mixed income. Mm. So maybe throwing that on the board. Um, and then um, it's something that came out of the Amherst, the slide that you had about Amherst, but it's come up in the housing production plan is the bedroom configuration. Ah, uh, yeah. So, so like anecdotally, you know, a family um, needs like, right, like three bedrooms, right? That's like a family oriented unit. Um, two bedrooms, you know, might be viable, but then a lot of, a lot of them end up being one bedrooms. Um, so maybe the you know the bedroom configuration might be on this continuum somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thoughts from people as to where you'd like to see either of those. I mean, mixed income definitely needs to be above market rate housing. Um, I think that's you know a natural continuum between market rate housing and affordable housing. Um, yeah, and. I mean, the bedroom configuration, that also needs to be taken into consideration. I mean, just by the nature of having larger families, there, we're more likely to see families that need affordable housing than individuals. I mean, obviously, individuals will need it, too. But, you know, if we want to make a attractive, affordable housing, I think we definitely need to take the bedrooms into consideration. That does lead to the idea of uh, mixed ages as well as mixed income. So something else to keep in mind. Yeah. yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah. Uh, I have a quick question about the um, the state. Jeff, the state wants us to have 16 units a year, right? That's correct of affordable housing, or something around there. Yeah, but, I think it's a little, a little higher. Yep. Yep. Okay. Do, does that take into account anything for? bedrooms or size or anything like that or is it just units um i will double check that but i my presumption is that it's just units yeah. like for okay. the purposes of that like to meet that goal um it would just be any units that are that are capital a affordable mm -hmm. yeah i also have not heard heard it's a good thing to check but i've also not heard of a breakdown on on unit size no. hey jeff this is a better way to say that it. it's not that the state wants us to have 16 units a year but if we are to reach a goal of 10 percent, we would probably have to put in 16 units a year is that right yes yep okay. and, and that's there is you know per, the perceived need right to 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 put on that number of units every year and they would they would be occupied like it's it's so it's you know it's a high a big need mm -hmm. 
other thoughts of things that you think are missing on the um, uh, building? So I was thinking of one, Emily, um, and I hope this this isn't too. I I didn't think of this beforehand, but um, <laughs> if we we have um, someone's going to join. I'm going to let them in. I don't know who this is, but um, we have three buildings, and you know with the notion of that gymnasium you know the gymnasium mm-hmm. come up in public discussions that came up in the downtown plan so that's the building that has the gymnasium but maple street school does not have the gymnasium so right. if we at some point would we want to maybe tailor these a little bit to each building yes okay i think I that's think- a great thing okay. to put in there let me actually zoom that in but i'm going to put it in a different color on this slide which is taylor um right and that's actually sort of what amherst did, amherst did right is because they sat there and said okay this building we'd like to preserve um so uh um you know there's precedent for that because yeah. i think you know trying to predict what most people would expect to see you know us try is yeah. some attempt to to save the gymnasium you know that that we will hear about that com- coming along mm-hmm. the the continuum so i think with maple i mean sorry now i'm going to mix it up but now with pepin i think um the gymnasium goes into the building use category somewhere mm-hmm. uh, but the other, you know, center obviously has no gymnasium, so it's not relevant to that school. And we don't want someone to try to cram in a gym in a space that doesn't exist now. So right, that kind of thing. right. We are not requiring that they build a gymnasium as part of uh, part of this. So, all right. So, Does, so Maple doesn't have a gym either. No. Because I, I thought we were losing three gyms, and if if you're saying two of the three buildings don't have gyms, how can we lose them? Maple has a cafe, a gymatorium, which is a big basement room. It's not a gym, though. It's, it's just a, a big. Gym. It's just okay. a big space. Okay. So I'm actually going to move us up the building. I'm just keep uh, to sustainable development. I'm just keeping an eye on the time and want to make sure that we hit the things that we didn't really hit last time. Um, in fact, I don't think we hit sustainable development at all because there aren't even any notes there. So let me pull this in um, and just get a sense from you all of, and we can revisit building um, afterwards if there are still some thoughts on that. But just get a, a sense from you on sustainable design and lead certification. Um, or any of the other certification programs that are out there for that matter. You know, there's sites as well. Um, I will say that, uh, and I am a LEED accredited professional, but I'm going to say it anyway, is that LEED certification can be quite expensive and time consuming. And so having that as a requirement could be limiting. I have seen it be um, a highly advant- advantageous to have LEED certification. I've also seen people put, you know, meets the criteria for lead certification, but doesn't actually go for it. Um, so there are there are ways of thinking about the requirements for lead and how you want to think about that. And then the same thing for sustainable de- design. And in fact, um, if the if there are specific components that are important to you for both of these, I do like Amherst's menu um, method uh, because that allows them and and could go with ju- what Jeff just said about tailoring the sites as well. So if there are particular elements of either of these that are important, it would be great to to know what those are and put them on our list. Can you explain what, I don't know what LEED certification is. So LEED is um, uh, a building, sort of, well, started off as a building certification, and it is um, uh, to create buildings that are sustainable in terms of energy and water, u- energy usage and water usage initially. Um, and they have different categories. So they have it for new buildings, for um, buildings that have been rehabbed. Um, they have also for the operations and maintenance of buildings, uh, and they have it for for neighborhood development, which is the, the certification that I have um, in terms of uh, selecting a building within a, or a building site within a neighborhood and the components there. Um, and it 
it's uh, a basically there's a, a checklist that each of these follows and you go through and uh, meet certain criteria at certain levels and then you can get certain your, your building could be platinum gold silver and i think there's a bronze as well so there's the different levels depending on how many points you get in your certification as i mentioned there are others out now there's sites which is um for landscaping and and citing the, the building that way and the 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 work around the um, building there's also a certification called well which is about having healthy buildings um, so looking at air quality um, and building materials so there there are a few of these but Leeds been around um, uh, the old it's the oldest of these checklists as far as I know I imagine that lead certification will get developers grants and things like that <laughs> The energy efficiencies that come from it, especially there are grants out there for especially for rehab of buildings for energy efficiencies. It's also um, there's always the uh, the developer tenant relationship in terms of energy efficiency and wastewater because uh, a lot of these requirements also reduce operating costs. And if you are somebody who is going to build and then own and operate the building, um, some of these sustainable Sustainable design are going to be more um, attractive to you as a developer. If you're a developer who's building to sell, some of it, some of it doesn't matter because you're not the one operating it. I mean, to the developer, it matters to to you know people who are concerned about sustainable de uh, design. But for an owner operator, a lot of these can result in those operating efficiencies. <laughs> So, if, I mean, I think that both sustainable and lead are important, but these are a perfect example of what Jeff was saying about um, tailoring it per per site. So I think that if we could put it on the, on the line with um, a caveat being mm -hmm. um, determined by you. site. Yeah. I'm going to see, and then I'm going to do that same thing. And so um, Amherst had identified things like reduced parking ratios, which I think we actually have talked about a little bit further up, but they, they had, um, you know, electric vehicle charging stations, site design that um, uh, was responsive to the environment. Are there any things um, that are specifically important to you or would you um like me to come up with a list based on some of the other rfps and and we can talk about it further and i'm i'm open to either option i think the list might help um spur the discussion and, and one thing that it was occurring to me is we're running so the path that we're running with the grant to get the due diligence we're also running this other path concurrently which is um these schools are located in our smart growth district and we're going through an amendment process now that we're, we're making sure that Pepin school right now the Pepin building is not in the 40R and so that's that's a number one to have the district cover the Pepin building and then we're going through the actual written ordinance with some tweaks and we're adding an area of town but there are design standards that come mm -hmm. with the smart growth overlay and the ordinance committee just met last night and added some elements under under sort of the green and sustainable kind of notion and and right now the way the design standards are set up is they're all encouraging so we're still at that stage of being delicate with you know encouraging that type of thing but not necessarily requiring it so that might be a really good resource because presumably the schools will get redeveloped under that smart growth zoning and they'll have to adhere to those design standards so that might be an actual document that we can absorb into this and it covers a lot of things that you talked about Emily. so like the site landscaping mm -hmm. so you know non-invasive plants or native plants um low impact development and so things like rain gardens um it's going to now encourage the use of solar um and i think the other one was um the reduction in parking so we actually have this document i think that runs parallel with this that we can maybe reference here or provide it to the group for for everyone to kind of see the things that we're already the planning board will already kind of look at some of these so it just kind of occurred to me when we were talking about this that we might have a jumping off point 
That would be great. And it may be that depending on how those end up, we might just be able to pull that into the RFP and say, hey, these are the new design standards. You have to meet them. So, um, yeah, that, that would be good to have a look at. Uh, Brad, I see your hand. Hand is up. Yeah, so I don't know if it necessarily belongs on this continuum, but um, I think that something that needs to be a requirement um, are specific air quality standards. Um, so, you know, in a lot of my research that I've done, um, people who live in either congregate housing or um, multi-unit housing developments uh, are at risk for a different uh, set of respiratory diseases that have synergy with one another. Um, so, you know, even if it just means that we have as a standard that the air filtration system needs to be able to filter out um you know respiratory droplets of of x size or if you know mm -hmm. for example merv 13 filters would be um the sufficient standard to um filter out things like covid19 um influenza tuberculosis for example um so you know that just is, it becomes a public health issue. So if we can make that a guarantee, then um, you know I think that at least covers our bases in making sure that, from a health standpoint, that our housing is equitable. That's great. That's a great idea. Brad, do you know? Are there other? Are is that is that a re requirement that's realistic? Are there? Are, is that a typical development that would go in? Would would it have that, or is that something? that is rarely seen do you know what kind of what kind yeah, of so i mean yeah um honestly it, it's just about making sure that the system can um be retrofitted for the appropriate amount of air filters um the filters themselves are not actually that expensive um it's just making sure that you have the right um I mean, I don't. I would have to look up what what that would realistically look like for an apartment building. But you know, for like um, city buses, for example, you know, the city bus system would be retrofitted for three MERV thirteen filters, and that would be sufficient <clears throat> for um, circulating the air to make sure that the buses are clean. So it would obviously be larger for an apartment building because it's a much larger space. But um, um, it's just making sure that the infrastructure is there to support those filters. <laughs> And it's something that's been talked about for office buildings as well, retrofitting office buildings from Earth 13 as people come back to work full time. So, yeah. it, you know, it's an interesting point because it's one of those things that you might think, well, wouldn't they do that anyway? But um, for there, there are some examples of uh, buildings where they don't have the obvious. So, for example, I know of a multifamily building that was built with a restaurant on the ground floor. Everybody knew there was going to be a restaurant there. It was it was built to have the restaurant there, and the um, uh, you know the noise insulation wasn't as good as it could have been. It's like oh that could have that could have been a standard if you're if you know you're going to have a restaurant, you have to have better noise insulation. Um, um, and you know there there are other stories like that where you don't want to be too specific, but if you know something's going in, so you know I think this is appropriate to say that we're concerned about the air quality, and especially if the buildings are retained, that they have to be retrofitted to match that. So I think it's a great point, Brad. Other thoughts? Yeah, Lauren. Uh, Wait, I thought I saw your hand. Sorry. No, nope, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Other other thoughts? I think Pat. So, was, Pat. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, I did for just a second. I kind of wanted to follow, uh, you know, Joe's question as, as far as affordable. Like, how it, how um, attainable is it for a contractor who's going to buy the building to be able to afford to do that? And it, and it just got me thinking about that lead certification piece. Mm -hmm. I know you mentioned that that it's relative. That's expensive to kind of go through with that. So part of me was thinking maybe that is more towards the middle versus I like the sustainability piece I think is you know right where it should be but mm -hmm. the lead certification I mean the, the the school is going through that we're going through that piece kind of with the school and I know it's an expensive piece so I just don't want that to that. Detain, detain, <laughs> deter somebody from you know um, jumping in I, and I know we're and I may be getting ahead of it because we're just kind of lining these up and then at some point 
you know, I think that was very helpful, the Amherst part, where, you know, these are adv advantageous things versus, so I, I'm assuming all these are going to kind of whittle mm -hmm. down into that at some point. But to me, as I was just thinking about that lead certification and, and even the, the air quality issue, or, you know, that piece, um, we don't want to make it impossible for somebody. We don't, but right. we want, we have standards that we would like. But I, I think that lead certification piece, as I thought about it more, should be right where you have it. Just my two cents on that. It's a good. It's a good. Oops, uh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to raise. <laughs> There's too many buttons on our screens these days, um, and the keyboard controls more of them than we realize. Um, that so that's exactly it. That that idea that the lead certification you probably don't want as a requirement because it's going to put some people off, but it could be a highly advantageous, or it could be a look. We've got the lead checklist. Um, we we'd like you to address as many of those as possible, and that's an advantageous. And a non-advantageous is you're not doing anything for sustainability at all. So that's where yeah. a lot of these is I kind of translate what you tell me today, what you told me last at our last meeting for our December meeting. That's, you know, where we'll be going back and forth to make sure we're getting it right in the RFP. So all right. So again, just checking on time, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, now, compatibility. So this was um, thinking about the development and the neighborhood. And again, we talked about it um, because we have a couple of notes here about the building code versus the energy, the stretch energy code. Um, uh, thinking about five stories for new development versus the existing height. Um, and then we, but we didn't put anything on the line. So I just wanted to see if there was something. Um, Jeff, you mentioned, of course, the zoning is being changed. So compatibility with zoning would now, of course, be compatibility with the new smart growth district rather than what it's ex on now, correct? Or is the smart growth an overlay that gives an option? Yep, the smart um, the smart growth is uh, it, it's optional. Okay. Um, I think the good news with this part is that the smart growth exists uh, like in its entirety, except <laughs> except for Pepin. So that change is kind of modest. And the other tweaks we're making to it are are really with an eye towards these these buildings. So um, it should generally be supportive. Um, the, the, these changes are all kind of like so it, the the change continues to. Um, codify a reduction in parking mm -hmm. and we've done this um, you know with people like Chris and the EDIC we have another committee and then the ordinance committee and the planning board are all supportive of the idea of lowering the parking standards because um, they're kind of seen as barriers and, and a lot of times they're not necessary so we're kind of doing that and then the other one is um, right now the smart growth says that um, the maximum number of affordable units you can have in a development is 50 percent of the units and so with an eye towards these schools, we, we want to say that you could do 100%. All, all of the units could be affordable. Um, so it's really leaning towards being super supportive and making it easier. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting seeing these here. And I don't know where we'll land with all of this. But right now, like, the idea of mixed uses is kind of less, it's less, it seems less prominent. I think, mm -hmm. um, with the focus on housing as a primary objective, then a lot of these things in my in my mind like are less relevant. Um, right. and, and especially if we're talking about a configuration where the buildings exist as they are today, then you know why I think a lot of these are even like more or less important because uh, you know the structure is usually the thing that is the first thing that bothers people. But if that stays, um, really some of these site design things would come up. Um, that's just my two cents uh, for other people. So I think the point on the night, uh, Joe, yes. Before I say anything, Joe, you raised your hand. Were you going to answer his question? Because it's, it's, it's a completely new point. So did you want to? Oh, yeah, uh, okay. I'm happy to answer that. So I, I think um, uh, just point on if this is all housing, the nighttime uses, especially the existing neighborhoods are residential neighborhoods. The, the nighttime use of a residential neighborhood is going to be compatible. I think where it was going to be different was when there was a discussion on the mixed use. So I would agree with that, uh, Jeff. And uh, traffic management, uh, just because, you know, it's a, it's a little bit more dense than the existing neighborhoods that might still a little bit 
be there but the nighttime and the daytime uses are really less and it sounds like zoning's a neutral um, I can probably go out just go ahead and put that on the line because it, it kind of is what it is we're not asking to, anybody to do anything different so these like fit here and here and then I saw Joe and then Pat is next yeah I would, I would. I wouldn't be surprised if we're saying the same thing. I mean, Jeff, I, I just my I kind of twinged a couple of times when I, I heard you say the parking reduction. And I know the idea is the zoning would encourage more businesses without having requ parking requirements. But I think it's crazy to think the need for the parking is going to go away if you say there's less. And I saw last time we left, the parking is way down again. I know Pat and I feel pretty strongly that that parking, and, and it was in, in the survey as well, that it should... I'm worried that when I hear you say, you know, there's re reducing the requirements of business for parking, then that's great for the business, but it doesn't mean there's not going to be a need for parking. Uh, just because you say we're, we're not going to make you have that parking. So I, I think we need to include that uh, further up. Yeah, and I, I think that's good. I, I guess my to clarify, it was just more like the, right now the zoning says you need um, two, two parking spaces per unit, and then you need um, you need like more spaces every 10 units and so for like the residential uses that's the idea is just to lower the residential parking requirements a little bit but i think the presumption is that we 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 do want to have some public parking um as an option um so joe i don't know if i mix that up but i i, I think it's a fair discussion so i just thought i'd try to make sure, sure okay. being clear about the the residential parking you know requirements should shrink maybe that's the presumption okay okay and Pat, you had your hand. Yeah, so um, a couple that, yes, I agree with the parking, but that's not why I raised my hand. Um, <clears throat> um, the one thing I was going to mention is, you know, we talk about a, a, a lot of the affordable housing and all of this, all of this being housing. And, and part of me, um, you know, the issue that I have with that, I, I think that's definitely a uh, something we need to look at but the other thing i have done over the last you know even if it's today even is i have the um the whole book that has all of the the information that came from those things and there's three different pieces here and so you got pepin center school and maple and the desired uses from all of the public input mm -hmm. and so there were as an example there's um 15 things 15 things listed for pepin school 15 things listed listed for maple school and there's i think 18 because i didn't count while i was sitting here uh <laughs> listed for um for center pepin and on each of those yes one thing was housing but there are also 15 or 16 other things that were things that people were thought were desirable now some of them are clearly not things that could probably happen but i don't want to just paint this as we're just going to do rfps that'll make these all affordable housing that's my gut I, I just think we need to just kind of branch a little bit and i know we have plenty of time but i don't think affordable housing for all of these properties is the general consensus of what the public wanted especially when you look at these these things that that were done over the, the time period that they did that's mm -hmm. just my two cents on that and i'll stop saying that's my two cents because i don't know why <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna cool. start adding it up soon <laughs> <laughs> so i'm adding obviously i'm adding this in uh two places one was where we we're just talking about neighborhood compatibility just adding a note back to the daytime and nighttime uses if we have mixed use in there those might creep up to be more important and then back to building uses uh, with these yellow stickers is just note that there was public input for mixed use i think we've been thinking that there'd still be some sort of flexibility um but uh you know that will again depend on what people decide to uh bid for so pam pamela pam or pamela i can't remember are you just muted Oops. Yeah, Pamela, thank you. Okay. Um, I I did a walk around with the mayor and the director of mass housing who came to town with an entourage and I was I don't fully understand and I was disappointed to hear her say that we can't just have all affordable housing. We need to have a blend and um 
So I just wanted to throw that in there so that, that probably we do have to consider some kind of mix for this. Thank you, Pamela. Um, Chris raised your hand and then um, Jeff, I don't know if after Chris, if you want to address the walk arounds as well. So Chris first. So I had two things. Jeff, you had mentioned that the smart growth overlay re requires no more than 50% affordable housing. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, that's the current the current zoning says that yes the the the, the, the smart the sit the state smart growth zoning right so how would we get past that um we what we will be doing is we'll we will be submitting our amendment to dhcd and they will review it but um in the early discussions with them they didn't think that was a, uh, an issue oh um, because the smart growth you know it's it's has multiple purposes, but one of which is to promote the construction of more affordable housing. So I guess there's a small chance that they will reject that. But I think um, pr presumably when it was created in 2009, there was probably that. Did he just freeze? I, th I think he did. He just froze. But, me too. Okay. I guess I'll go to the, the my second part unless he pops back in. Um, I think what Pamela and Pat are saying could be rec could be reconciled by teardowns and rebuilds. So if you had like five story building in one site, you could have first floor or more doing whatever mm -hmm. community points that Pat thinks is important, and me too. Um, and then we also get a lot of affordable housing out of it as well. Yeah, but, saw... but we lose the building. Uh, Pat, I mean uh, Jeff, you dropped off. <laughs> Fine. I think I was just saying that I think we were probably playing it safe with the 50% affordable at that time, but it is something that will be subject to DHCD approving, but that's the goal. We'll know pretty soon. So, Jeff, uh, you have to leave very shortly, right? I should try to leave soon. I, I can stay till 610, I think. They're probably okay. doing speak, so I, I think I, I'm okay. So if you could address uh, the walk around that Pamela mentioned, and then also uh, Lauren's got a question. I mean, at least get those before you have to drop yeah, off. I appreciate Pamela's comments. I mean, I think um, we've had multiple state agencies and officials come to East Hampton, and it's something that the mayor does really well is promote East Hampton. You know, a lot of times Boston, if you're if you're west of Worcester, they don't even know you exist. So um, I didn't hear that directly from Mass Housing, but I think there could be some there could be some factual information there that I didn't get. Um, Mass Housing, one of the things that they said is they're like a bank, um, and so they they help to fund projects, and so there might be something in their in their funding mechanism that may do that. Um, but at the same time, we have talk to some other affordable housing developers who didn't seem to suggest that they couldn't do all affordable and um, it's something we can flush out a little bit i think it's worth kind of flushing this out a little bit more as we go but um, developer will go for affordable housing tax credits um, that's one of the ways that developers do this and i think my questions to the, some of those people would be you know, if a developer is pursuing affordable housing tax credits, is there is there something that limits them from doing 100% uh, affordable in a building? And so that's kind of like what we're thinking about is if you took one of the buildings and it was 100% affordable and you took another building and it was mixed use, you know, we, we, we have a lot of like, it's like moving the, moving a cup around. Like there's a lot of different scenarios that might play out. But uh, Pamela, I'm going to follow up on that to clarify, you know, whether that was maybe a mass housing restriction or whether it's something that like ha happens across the board. I'm, I'm interested in checking on that. I'm not sure, but Chris, Christina said it. I think that's your name, Christina Tornigay. She said it in passing when we were outside of Eastworks after we spoke with Will Bundy. And she says, and you can't have all affordable. You have to have all market levels. And then I asked the mayor a little bit later to to reiterate that and she did so i mean okay. it's i don't understand all the reasons but yeah that's what they said okay i appreciate that that's good information i i just got texted i'm gonna jump off emily i think you're the co-host okay so do you mind if i jump off or should we no no go ahead and jump off if you if we all disappear then i'll see you in december <laughs> <laughs> but if not we can keep chatting for a while okay all right. Thank you, everybody. Sorry about that. Um, 
All right, fingers crossed. Ready? Uh, I, I just want to throw in, I didn't know if she meant per building or like the town, but that's what they said. Okay, come yeah. on. No, that's fair. I'm going to check. It's important to understand that. So I appreciate you sharing that. All right. Um, thanks, everybody. Sorry, this was un kind of unanticipated. So here we go. Ready? <laughs> um, it says you can't end this video call yet. This call is being recorded. If you want to end, call for everybody to stop recording first. All right. I'll let me um let me think about what to do here. I'm going to mute myself and turn off my camera for a second and find out where city council is at. Okay. I'll I think I can. I think I can restart recording if you leave, but I'm not positive on that. Okay. No. I'll um. I'll just tune out for a minute and figure out where they are at. Okay. Great. All right. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you for your patience. Um. What was your what? What's your question or comment? Um. A comment. Um. Just that. Uh, you know, regarding the the community input sessions mm -hmm. um, about you know how these schools should be reused. I mean, that was pre pre-pandemic correct yeah yes yeah. Um, mm -hmm. you know the the <laughs> you know the need for affordable housing has become you know much more of an issue uh in these last two years i you know i it's something to keep in mind i think also too um uh and i'm not knocking public input at all because i think it's critically important but just um we're going to have a different level of information about the buildings as we go through this process as they had when they were doing the public forums and so that may well change what we can do because there are some things that buildings can be rehabbed to accommodate and some things that they can't so um and then obviously whether it's the the continued need for market housing or for affordable housing sorry versus um also what the market's looking to do and there's a strong market for creating affordable housing that may also have an impact on what we see in terms of this so we can leave certain things open um the same is actually true of the parking is that uh you know a community can set their parking rate but the market may come through and say you know we need more parking than you're you know than, than you're suggesting and We'd like to put that in there um, versus left. So that's something else to remember as well. Um, some communities are going to parking maximums rather than parking minimums, which is, a, is an interesting concept. Um, I don't think that's something we need to bring into this conversation, but parking is one of those ongoing, ongoing things. So um, let me just pull out and see what else we haven't talked about. We've got a little bit of compatibility. Um, so it looks like from my, no, we didn't really talk about financial considerations. I think probably because a lot of these aren't, um, uh, you know, financial capability of the proponent, those that we consider to be more financially capable are likely to be more highly advantageous. So I'm not sure there was a lot that we needed to put on the, um, on the timeline here, on, on our, on our um, more versus less important line here, but um, Chris. Well, I, you know, I think economic benefits is important because, you know, you can look at that in any way. Um, having a whole mess of affordable housing is an economic benefit, but also considering having a first floor retail or gym or whatever, um, it enters the equation. I was going to ask about economic benefits. And I was also going to ask about the redevelopment schedule um, because these can take a few years. To, you know, it's not that you sign a document and suddenly the building happens, right? And uh, whether or not uh, a developer that has a schedule that is a sort of more aggressive versus less aggressive, if that's an issue um, for this community. But, but I, I agree on the economic uh, benefits and thought I'd throw the schedule in as well. Uh, Chris, again. Sorry, I don't mean to monopolize everything, yeah, but yeah. for me, the redevelopment schedule is not important. I think getting it right far outweighs that. So if it takes an extra six months to get the buildings that we really want, mm -hmm. that's fine. Yeah, I, I want to six years. <laughs> Fair. Uh, Laura and I think the same, yeah. <laughs> so, so we won't put it at the uh, we won't put it under uh, the least important, but we'll we'll put it a little shade under the economic benefits. So, um, Pamela and Brad, I didn't see which one of you is first. So, yeah. 
I just had a couple random things. I don't know if they've all been mentioned or where they would go. Uh, if if it were a teardown, could they put in underground parking and rooftop gardens or community, some kind of patio, something on the roof that might tie into sustainability and community? Ah. And has it already been marked somewhere that the buildings will also be accessible for those in wheelchairs, or at least have a couple accessible units. I think we had accessibility, but why don't we just put accessibility right here under architecture design and just making sure, because I have a comment, which are the important architectural elements, and I think that would do, um, or will do if this actually types. Here we go. And then the second thing was, now I will say in terms of the um, underground parking and uh, the rooftop garden, um, certainly a fan of the rooftop garden, but something to remember on structured parking, which would be underground or even podium style versus surface parking. Um, when I work with colleagues uh, and we do pro formas on development, surface parking, I think we have at about $8,000 or so a space. Um, Structured parking is about thirty thousand dollars a space. Wow! So <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it did seem big dreamish, but it was worth mentioning. I yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it's not that it's not done because it is, but um, uh, it's uh, um, it's more expensive. So I wouldn't put it in as a requirement, but let's let's capture that idea. Brad, your thoughts? Oh, I can't hear you, which is funny because I don't think you're on mute. No, I was on mute. That's weird. That thing just told me. Are you sure you're not unmuted? Um, no, I, what I was going to say is that I do need to step out because my meeting is coming up. But um, for what uh, Pamela just said, I want to um, also emphasize um, rooftop garden type situations. Um, I know that in the next term on city council, there's going to be a strong push for uh, native pollination mm -hmm. uh, education and advocacy. And I feel like that could really go a long way um, towards that goal. So I think that there would definitely be some uh, attractive elements to um you know utilizing space like that so um but anyways with that i i'm gonna step out i just wanted to say thank you for everybody um really great work and um, i'll see you soon great looking forward okay. to seeing you soon thanks and that, just to follow up on um, uh, what Brad just said, that's the sort of thing that absolutely could fit into a highly advantageous, um, both uh, something like a rooftop garden or site design with native uh, pollinate, pollinator um, gardens. You know, all of those could fit neatly uh, into into that idea. So um, just to consider. Um, now we've been going for about an hour and uh, 12 minutes or so. Um, thoughts on how long you all would like to co continue? Um, I have to I have to leave in in probably five or ten minutes. <laughs> okay. So um, let, well then why don't we do it uh, another five minutes. Jeff has come back. I don't know if that's permanent or if he's leaving us again, <laughs> but I, I can hang for five minutes. I think they're taking up another matter, so I'm good. But I apologize for sort of jumping off there. Okay. So why don't we do five more minutes, and um, then that way we don't have to worry about somehow losing the recording. Is there, in our five minutes, um, uh, is there anything else, community benefits, financial, architectural design, circulation, access, and parking, compatibility, sustainable development, or building uses? Is there anything else that you want to touch on? Can you send us what we have here so we can look at it? Yes, I should be able to um, export it uh, into that so you th I can send that. Let me just make a note. And also maybe the if you have the Adams and the Amherst RFP. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yep. And I think to Joe's point, right, so Emily, this is a an iterative process, right? We want to we want to wrap it up at some point, but at, we will also see this deduced to writing in a different format, right? And we will still have a chance to 
oh, say, oh, we forgot like that, or where does this fit in? And like, right. At, but at some point, we'll need to stop. But the next iteration, we will still have a chance. Like, this isn't the final time per se. Oh yeah. Yeah. And at some point, we have to do requirement versus not. Yeah. You know, <laughs> which is the big yeah. one. So, so that brings us. Actually, maybe we used our last five minutes to just talk about the next meeting. So, um, my goal was to start translating these into those written formats so we can discuss them. As Jeff said, there's still time. So, you know, we'll start discussing them at our next meeting in December. Then as we start to put things into the RFP, as we start to get more information about the other conditions that the city's working on collecting, we'll still have a chance to go back to what we decide, what we thought about in terms of the criteria versus requirements and uh, make changes to those. So even December starting to put it in written form, that's not our last crack at it, but um, it allows us to keep to developing those ideas. Okay. I have a quick question for Pat, if, if no one has anything. Pat, where'd you get the book? Did you print that yourself? <laughs> I did not. I, uh, I asked the uh, Jeff over at the planning department before the first meeting. I, I said, uh, I looked and I knew I could print it. Uh, but I figured I would ask and see if he had a copy. <laughs> and I have other copies. If anyone would like one, I, I can get you one. I, yeah. Okay. It's great to have. It's it's okay. it's I helped me two. be able to go just yeah. kind of back and forth. So I'll take one too. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> You knew that was going to happen, Me Jeff. Too. Too. <laughs> Just everybody, Jeff. What, what about I asked those? first? <laughs> yeah, I, I'll put out an email. I'll just confirm by email who wants one. That's fine. We, I have I have several of them, so I can do that. Um, I think the only other thing is um, public speak. So I, I see one person who's on the call, and you don't need to jump in. Or, or I see Matt Cummings is on the call, and as not a committee member, I just wanted to maybe Joe, if that's okay to offer, if Matt, had of course, anything. sure. Um, Matt, if, if you hear us, if you want to unmute and say anything, you can. If you don't, that's fine too. I just want to make sure before we close off the meeting, I would offer that. And just for purposes of reiteration i i have built a web page for this project oh i see matt unmuted um so i'll stop for a second do you want to say anything to the to this group i was just going to say thank you for the offer but i i just wanted to listen in i live right across from the maple street school so i was kind of interested in hearing about uh how things were going great i think it's great that you came and um we there is a web page under the planning department um where information is being put um we're kind of at the beginning even though we've had two meetings we're still at the beginning stage but there's the downtown plan um the housing production plan the videos from the first two meetings and the minutes so oh the minutes that would be the only other thing um if we wanted to try to tackle those we can also just table those to the next time since we're running short on time so we'll do that okay are you ready for a motion to adjourn jeff I think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, a, I got a right. question. Sure. Um, before we go, are we brainstorming sustainability ideas, or we just have that on the board as we want sustainable stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I'll come up with some options. Um, I like the idea of putting sustainable stuff in the RFP. We want sustainable <laughs> stuff. I'll come up with some options and we can brainstorm around them. So I just thought it was important that Lauren mentioned we're in a new world now and the air quality that Brad mentioned and there are other new post pandemic materials and things that help reduce. Mm -hmm. I'll, I know this is no longer on the board, but I've got it up. I'll add that to that. Great. And did we talk about um, our tentatively we were looking at December 7th for the next meeting? Um, I know it didn't work for everybody, but it was the date of that doodle poll that worked the best. So um, I guess we won't make an official statement that's the next meeting, but um, December eighth. December eighth. Okay. December eighth. Yeah. That fair to everyone to, to think about December eighth for the next meeting. Okay. Great. Joe, did you need an official motion? Well, I, 
Yes, I'll take an official motion to adjourn. <laughs> okay. Come, Come on, on, Pat. To adjourn. I'll okay. give you one. Go for it. Okay. Uh, You're okay. left in the dust. <laughs> Is there a second then? Second. Not All, those in, All those in favor. Hi. Hi. Hey. See you Thank in you December. All. Thank you. All. See you bye. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving. You too. You as Same well. to you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.